I'm here with Ashraf Ghani, the um, chair of the Commission for Transition in Afghanistan and the founder of the Institute for State Effectiveness. Ashraf, how do societies ensure that governments and economic structures can take a multi-stakeholder approach that creates more equality? Um, you noticed that a lot of the conversations at the World Economic Forum have focused very internally on this problem. Are there examples outside of the region that the region can look to? Uh, yes, there are many examples, but for instance, if you take cities, which is a key issue of governance at the core to job creation, three cities globally provide the sort of continuity. One is Curitiba in Brazil, the other is Chicago in the United States, and the third is Barcelona in Spain. Each of these are distinctive in that not only if they manage to put together multi-stakeholder coalitions, they've managed to maintain those coalitions over a 30-year period and provide a type of continuity that then coalition building is translated into actions that have created the trust and resulted in very substantial transformation. It, it you picked up 30 years ago the bidding as to what three cities would, would stand out, these would not have been your cities. So against odds. Uh, by contrast, or it's another category of cities that uh, a very important man writing on the subject, a man called uh, Brugman, uh, calls the cities of great opportunity, where everything potentially is right, but the right governance arrangement never gels. So they're always waiting for opportunity. And what is important in this context is to be able to avoid the second category and really focus on that. At the level of government, Malaysia, for instance, provides an example. They invented the future vision. 2020, because former Prime Minister Mahathir uh, was an ophthalmologist, so it was not the year 2020. It was about uh, seeing with perfect vision. And that has given them a set of prioritization that, you know, some people might criticize some of the outcomes, but it has transformed Malaysia from being a really backward uh, uh, economic terms place to being uh, a very dynamic place, and they've stayed with it. Uh, so there are a range of examples depending on the type of level of government. You know, if for those parts of the Arab world which are really city states, like the Gulf, Singapore and Hong Kong uh, provide types of transformational efforts that are really at the city city state level. And then with giant countries, uh, what has happened with South Korea, what has happened with Brazil, what has happened with Indonesia. Uh, for Egypt, Indonesia, for instance, could offer a lot of examples. It's not that Indonesia has figured everything, but the risks uh, of 12 years ago uh, post-98, if really overcome. I mean, the system is acquired peacefully the capacity to overcome internal conflict, to be able to create uh, a process for dealing with some of its most contentious issues, to routinize democratic elections in a context that risk of dictatorship was very high. So one can refer to a range of things depending on specific things. Region-wide, again, uh, one can think uh, of a slow process or relatively fast process that can bring some of the regional issues together. Uh, so three units of analysis, a local level, a national level, and a regional level. Uh, but the key task is not the process, but also the outcome around which prioritization must take place, and then the relentless issue of implementation and not just talking. I see. And um, how much of this change has to come from the bottom up and how much has to come from the top down in your opinion? I mean, what are some vehicles that are available to citizens to put pressure on outdated systems? Well, the citizens have served notice on governments. What the Arab Spring has done is to give the notice. So it's like a student who's failed 
and is really getting a second chance. And that message is loud and clear. When you have three of the longest serving rulers, one fleeing, one being under trial, and the third being killed, this is a wake-up call. Uh, there's the 100 million youth that don't have a future. They're called the waiting generation. Uh, they can't, for the first time in the history of the area, they could not get married. They didn't have jobs. And they've shown that they're no longer going to be waiting. Uh, so I think in that sense, uh, if you listen uh, to His Majesty the King of Jordan, this kind of speech uh, is a response to the events that have shaken uh, the area to its foundation. Now the question is to avoid a bottom-up or top-down confrontation. It's to be able to bring the right coalition making to the process and to introduce a sense of realism and a sense of feasibility. Uh, the area is not going to be transformed within two years, given the set of problems. To create the 45 million jobs uh, is a Herculean task. China adds 10 million uh, jobs a year, but then it's geared towards that, and it took them a fairly long time to do that. Uh, what is going to be required for the governments is to master a sense of urgency so that they can persuade the people at the bottom that their issues are the issues of the top. What is required is a new social contract where the issues that have been really raised bottom up are going to be solved top down because you need a top down process working up with the bottom up so that the very distinction is avoided. Systems that function in terms of citizen-focused processes, avoid a, a top-down or a bottom-up process. Of course, this does not mean that the space for civil society and for civic action must disappear, but the responsibility is primarily to avoid a system implosion, a system collapse, because we've seen that in this part of the world, the promise of transformation at times is not resulting in transformation, but in massive dislocation and instability. Yes. And that risk has to be avoided. Yes. Thank you for sharing your insights with Wamda. Thank you.